and will be the scandalous Seymours. While sweet and demure Queen Jane is remembered as the one woman Henry VIII truly loved, she's the only one not divorced or beheaded or widowed, yet her family name is painted red by the morons she shared blood with. Jane's parents were Sir John Seymour and Lady Marjorie Wentworth. He was a soldier and courtier serving both Henry VII and VIII. However, one issue is not always mentioned in his biographies is the alleged affair he had with his daughter-in-law, Catherine Filio, the wife of his eldest son Edward. Edward and Catherine were politically and financially a good match during their marriage in 1519, but they hated each other. They could not stand each other at all. So in the 1520s, while Edward is out playing toy soldier and banging working girls, Catherine gets in touch with her father-in-law a little too much. By the time Catherine birthed a son, the less than subtle affair was so widely known that her father John changed the line of heirs away from her. Not to mention the child's paternity was so in doubt her husband Edward refused to acknowledge his son John as his own. Catherine was exiled to a convent where she remained until her death. Then there's Jane Seymour's dashing younger brother Sir Thomas Seymour, who's best known for marrying Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's widow. While Catherine Parr was pregnant, however, Thomas Seymour started hitting on the uncomfortably young future Elizabeth I. Then Thomas began visiting the young king, giving him candy in return for trying to schmooze power from him. What Thomas intended on the night he was discovered trying to break into the king's apartments at Hampton Court Palace was never really established, hurt, harm, or otherwise. Scholars have suggested it was an, an attempted person theft or it might have been another attempt to weirdly try and win the young king over onto his side. Either way, he was caught at the king's apartment at night trying to break in with a hand arm which he had already used to pop one of Edward's, the beloved pet spaniels, when it barked at this unexpected intruder. He was sentenced to death the next day. Queen number nine is the heartless hag, aka Catherine de Medici. Maybe calling her a hag is harsh, but heartless is a title she earned. Listen girl, while it's no news to the world that Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress Diane de Poitiers, as he loved her more than he could ever love Catherine, we got sympathy for the woman. She's put in an arranged marriage, she actually loved him but he never loves her and always makes her secondary to the woman he does love despite her not having enough authority but she kind of does but she definitely doesn't. It's a messy situation that make any slighted woman into an emotionally numb and void machine. Now does that excuse Henry being on his deathbed? Begging and begging Catherine to just open the bedroom door and let his mistress Diane in so he can see her one last time before he dies? I don't know. Kinda. Maybe. I Maybe I'm predictive. I don't know. Catherine really did do that by the way. She barricaded herself into Henry's room while he died, while Diane tried over and over to get in to see Henry as he, bedlocked and slowly suffering, pleaded to see her in return. But Catherine never folded. However, that wasn't what made her a terrible queen. She proved herself as one of the worst queens in history when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be killed in front of her. Catherine took out her own suffering and pushed it onto her daughter, the way many mothers of the world, both past and present, absconded their suffering onto their daughters. She could have broken the cycle, but instead she wanted her daughter to feel the pain and lovelessness that she had. Catherine would fight over her married daughter's adulteries and affairs as she too had been forced into an unhappy arranged marriage. It said that Catherine's screams could be heard echoing throughout the palace. During one instance when the queen mother found out about her daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her up in the castle and nobody saw her again. Queen number eight is the pain of Spain. No one expected the Spanish Inquisition. Well, except for Queen Isabel I of Castile, the evil queen of Spain, who began the campaign to purify her country and aided in financing Christopher Columbus's famous voyage in 1492 that would end the lives of 250 million indigenous people in the New World and subsequently launch the stealing of people from Africa for forced labor. Wildly, she's still best known for her formidable streak during the Four Year War for the succession of Castile against her niece Joanna. And yes, it's the crazy Joanna. Queen Isabel and her husband Ferdinand expanded the power of the monarchy, purging the influence of the nobles and reinstating Catholicism as the supreme religion of Spain. This is something they did so so well that Pope Alexander declared them Catholic monarchs for the work of their oh so amazing Spanish Inquisition that also oppressed Jewish and Muslim minorities. When she chose to purify her country, it meant she ordered that either all the Jews and Muslims convert to Catholicism or get thrown out, having them rounded up and brought to the Spanish court to either pledge their faith to Catholicism in front of her and Ferdinand or get the boot. And it's how most who refused to renounce their faith ended up, instead of adrift on a boat somewhere. Queen number seven is Angry Irene, the first and only of 
the Byzantine empresses, Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802 CE, and she went from empress consort to empress regent to finally being the sole empress before being deposed after a reign of just five years, only for her son Emperor Constantine to be an unpopular and crappy emperor following her. The mother-son duo was indeed a Greek tragedy. Irene and her son had signed a document decreeing that icon veneration was not the same as worship and thus restored it to their empire, and the relations between the Church of Constantinople and the Church of Rome. The Empress was an ambitious woman and wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire. This then led to the late Leo IV's half-brother staging another coup to overthrow Irene. When their plots discovered, they're forced to be ordained as priests by Irene for punishment. You can tell she had a sense of humor. With the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son after their relationship went to crap thanks to her forcing him to marry a woman he hated and her refusing to stop co-ruling once he was old enough to rule alone. The conflict between Constantine and his mother culminated in 797, wherein Irene catched a conspiracy to take the throne for herself. In 786, the public had turned against Constantine after he decided to divorce said wife and marry the mistress, so Irene successfully arrested her son and brought him to the imperial palace where she stood over him as he was restrained and his eyes were gouged out. And then Constantine was never heard from again. Queen number six is the spurned mother. During the 6th century, Cyrus the Great ruled the Achaemenid Empire with an iron fist, one of the most powerful Persian rulers who ever lived. He won battle after battle during his long and violent reign. Stories of his brutality and military cunning struck fear into the hearts of other people for thousands of miles. However, he was felled by one very, very powerful woman named Tomidus, queen of the Macedae, a group of Scythian people who lived in Central Asia at the times of Cyrus's rule. By the Middle Ages, those Macedae people became a group that's still well known today, the Huns. Now, at first, good old Cyrus didn't view the Huns as a threat. In fact, he deemed them so worthy of the brush off that for fun one night, he tripped a group of them into getting drunk when they'd never had liquor before. While they were inebriated, Cyrus's men imprisoned them. Waking up still drunk and imprisoned and having never experienced the feeling before, the men were terrified and they didn't know what kind of spell or poison they'd been given. In fact, one man gets so scared of the poison that he takes his own life lest it end it painfully. Again, Cyrus didn't think much of that crap as he considered the man to just be another nomad, but he was far from. He was Tomaris's beloved son and she was their queen. Enraged at her son's death, Tomaris sent messengers to Cyrus demanding answers and compensation. When Cyrus ignored all those requests, the grieving mother wiped her tears, took a deep breath, and decided it was time to rain literal hell on the man. Tomaris challenged the Persians to a battle and Cyrus accepted. The Macetae had more soldiers who were more well trained than they'd ever let on, and they were mounted on some of the largest steeds the Persians had ever seen. Cyrus was in trouble as Tomaris' men surrounded the Persians on all sides and started killing thousands. As for Cyrus himself, Tomaris personally saw to it that he was cut down by her own sword. Then she placed his severed head in a bag of blood and rode home to celebrate the victory in honor of her fallen son. Leader number five is Cleopatra. Everyone knows Cleopatra. There's already been so much written about it, you could drown in it. Yet we still know next to nothing about her. But thanks to a famous smear campaign against her by hmm, everyone in ancient times, I can list off a few not so nice details about this queen to fit more into our repulsive theme. If you want to learn more about her life, maybe check out the recent top 10 filthy secrets of Cleopatra that'll make you blush video on our channel Bumblebee. Maybe while you're at it, subscribe to the Hive if you want to see more like it. Born in 69 BCE, Cleopatra's seventh Tia Philopater was bred to be a ruler, having come from a long line of royal siblings having children together, which makes the family tree look a lot more like a family ladder when drawn on paper, just instead of like branching out roots. And apparently sharing a bed with a cousin isn't enough, you have to share names too. About 90% of Cleopatra's family was either named Ptolemy or Cleopatra. Every now and then a Bernice or an Arsenio was thrown in there to give us a break. I guess it would make inter-family relations a little bit less weird and more normalized if your dad, uncle, brother, brother, half-brother, brother, a new husband slash brother, all have the same name, maybe a different Cleopatra who famously married two of her brothers and also killed at least one of them. The other one, she had somebody else do it for. Leader number four is Amos. Amos was the principal wife of Pharaoh Thutmose the first in the 18th dynasty and the mother of Hatshepsut, who went on to become one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. She had many titles, king's great wife, king's sister, hereditary princess, great of praises, and mistress of the two lands. However, it appears she is a rare occurrence of a primary wife not being 
of royal blood, which would explain why her probable son, Prince Amen Molnes, was not mentioned in the Thebian mortuary chapel of Wadmos, which attests her husband's secondary wife and her sons. The whereabouts of Aemos's tomb and mummy remain unknown, likely one of the many lost to pillaging and weird Victorian unwrapping parties. However, Stella found in a defu that once belonged to an official called Yuf remains a testament to her existence. He recorded that the Queen Amos appointed him as an assistant treasurer and entrusted him with the service to a statute of Her Majesty. Amos owes a lot of thanks to her daughter, Hatshepsut, however, for plastering her face everywhere. As you'll learn in the next segment, Hatshepsut dedicated herself as a demigod and so put up many etchings and murals of her divine conception, the image of the god Amun approaching her mother, Amos, or some more compromising images of the two together. Good for Amos catching a god's attention. Leader number three is Hatshepsut. So, from mother to daughter, let's talk about this train wreck who was also the most influential and long ruling Egyptian queen and was known to be a great diplomat during her 22 year reign. She is also regarded as the first great woman in recorded history. Hatshepsut was only the second known woman to assume the throne as king of Upper and Lower Egypt after Queen Sobanekfu, whom was the model for this pharaoh as a queen and whom she based many of her decisions upon. Upon Thutmose II's death, the throne was passed to Thutmose III and Hashifsot, who was the aunt and stepmother, acted as regent until simply just taking the crown herself. Like pretty much every Egyptian queen short of Cleopatra, Hattie dressed in men's royal garb, wore a false beard and created statues of herself with the pharaoh's headdress. During the seventh year of her reign, however, she went even further and asked to be depicted as a man, ordering to be referred to not as a queen, but as a king. Hattie surrounded herself with strong and loyal advisors, her favorite being the royal steward Senemut, who many believe was having an affair with the queen. The evidence for this claim is the fact that Hatshepsut allowed Senemut to place his name and image of himself behind one of the main doors of the Dieser Dessou, which is rare, and, and an unusual share of credit. That and plenty of graffiti made by peasants and workers depict the two in compromising positions. Not kidding, ancient R-rated graffiti. Anyway, Hattie's reign was peaceful, a time where many monuments were erected of her, of a mun who she claimed was her lineage was based off of a Bastet, maybe a few more of her, you know, to be humble. However, after her death, her successor, who was possibly even her own stepson, attempted to erase all record of her, destroyed statues, burnt documents, attempted to remove her presence from Egypt. This effort only half works. While we don't know much as we wish we could, Hatshepsut is still remembered to this day. Leader number two is Nefertiti. This is the queen married to the cult guy who was so hated in Egypt that everyone agreed to ignore that he had ever happened. Unfortunately, it means this beauty had her name tarnished in the process, call it canceled by association. That's why Taylor Swift broke up with the problematic singer guy Maddie. I think the name alone is worth the breakup. Why are you in your mid thirties but still going by Maddie? Nefertiti's name can translate to a beautiful woman has arrived and that she had from parents unknown. We haven't figured that part out. A life-size bust of the queen was found in 1912 and is her most famous image and depiction, and it shows she really was a stunner. To the extent it's believed that ancient Egyptians revered her as a fertility goddess embodied. However, other Egyptian art depicts Nefertiti in ways normally only pharaohs are shown. For instance, she's portrayed smiting enemies, such as on a ship, raising her right hand to kill female prisoners, a depiction often seen on male pharaohs. Additionally, the type of helmet-like crown Nefertiti is wearing in the bust is typically reserved for pharaohs or the goddess Tefnut or Hathor. One idea is that after Akhenaten's death, Nefertiti's power and popularity was so great she was able to rule as pharaoh in her own right. Egyptian records mention a figure named Neferen Fatuen, who ruled Egypt for a brief time. Like how actors took stage names, pharaohs actually took throne names and it's speculated this was the throne name for Nefertiti. This means our girl was on the throne for three years. But as you know, after her reign, the Egyptian people tried to wash her away at, to the best of their abilities. Took Mahan, undid Akhenaten's religious reform, Armana became abandoned, and images of Akhenaten and Nefertiti are destroyed. Leader number one is Aset. You may know her by her Grecian name, however, Isis. She was the queen mother of all gods. Her name quite literally translates to queen of the throne, which is reflected in her headdress, which is sometimes a literal throne. However, sometimes it takes on traits from Hathors or Mutz to represent her assimilation with other women in the pantheon. While she seemingly started as a side figure, 
figure to her husband Osiris, she was quickly transformed into the queen of the universe and an embodiment of cosmic order. By the Roman period, a Seth was believed to control fate and linear existence itself. This is accredited to the story of Ra's secret name, wherein a Seth is able to find out the true name of Ra, something no other god knows, and ultimately makes her his equal, if not more powerful than he. A Seth was the sister and wife of the god Osiris, ruler of the underworld. It is said that she and Osiris were in love with each other even within the womb. As he was king of Egypt, Isis was queen, and one who supported her husband and taught the women of Egypt to weave, bake, and brew beer. Seth was always angry with this relation, as Isis reigned over the land of Egypt in the wake of the traveling Osiris instead of Seth. She was stronger, and he regarded this with jealous eyes as well as the good works of his brother, for his heart was full of evil and he loved warfare better than peace. The queens frustrated his wicked designs, so he sought in vain to prevail in battle against her and plotted to overcome Osiris by Gal. This is how the famous story of Osiris' death, Horus' birth, and the grieving of Seth prevails as one of Egypt's most famous stories. Seth tricks Osiris into the coffin, which he tosses in the Nile. The grieving of Seth refused to accept this and searched far and wide as a fugitive, birthing their son Horus on the journey. When she finds the coffin, she returns it to Egypt. Unfortunately, Seth finds it hidden again and dismembers Osiris, scattering the pieces. Isis still refuses to relent. She finds the pieces and entombs them. Anubis, with the assistance of Thoth and Horus, united the severed portions of the body of Osiris, which they wrapped in linen bandage. Thus, the origin of the mummy form of the god. Osiris then became the judge and king of the dead, residing in the underworld, as Isis remained with Horus on the above. Number 10, Mary the First. So this is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history as the first woman ever to be, you know, the Queen of England. Instead, she is mostly remembered as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary, a name she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to the Reformation. Look, the interwebs don't like the B word, so I had to spell it out. So I'm hoping you figured out what I was trying to say. The most controversial part of her reign was her religious policy. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to reaffirm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear through England, and around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country. I wonder why. In February of 1555, well, um, the uh, executions began. Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Cranmer repented his Protestant faith and technically, under law, he should have been absolved as a repentant, but Mary refused to accept his absolution and had him burned at the stake as well just to, you know, Set an example, or for funsies. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, most of them by burning at the stake simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years, since she passed in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer and was succeeded by Elizabeth I. Number nine, Wu Zetian. Look, I know it's in the title of today that I'd be talking about evil queens, but I support all women's wrongs. And rulers in other countries tend to have different titles to their equivalent of queens. So Wu was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects, including writing, music, literature, and perhaps most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. By the age of 14, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor, who became Emperor Gaozong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. I'm not going to unpack that. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly after the birth, it passed, with evidence showing um, strangulation. So Wu accused Empress Wang of the death, and Wang lost favor with the emperor. The most popular theory is that Wu actually uh, did the act to her own daughter. So thereafter, the emperor conferred with his chancellors and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned, and promoted Wu to empress. Later on, the emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this, because, you know, can't have any witnesses. Upon her accession to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives, or 
er, executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them uh, executed as well, and their families became slaves within the Imperial Palace. In another incident, she killed her niece with poison, accused two others of the death, and executed them. She eventually passed after repeated bouts with illness, so nothing nefarious there. Number 8, Isabella of Castile. So when Isabella was born on the 22nd of April in 1451, there was little chance she would ever become monarch of Castile, as she was very far removed from the direct royal lineage. War, politics, and subterfuge intervened, however, and for many years, the Kingdom of Spain was in turmoil, suffering from civil wars and uh, a lot of chaos. To quell one of the rebellions, the hand of Isabella was promised to the commoner, Pedro Duran Acuna Pacheco, but on his way to her, he suddenly fell ill and, um, passed. Now, this immensely fortuitous event for Isabella cemented her devotion to her faith, since she didn't exactly want to marry a commoner and prayed for divine intervention. Her marriage to Ferdinand, heir to the thrones of Castile and Aragon, cemented her future power. After the death of the King of Castile, the throne was given to Isabella. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians, which led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and torture of mostly Jewish and Muslim folks. Isabella waged war on the Kingdom of Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall in the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as the liberation of Spain, for many others, it was open genocide. By the time Granada was annexed, 100,000 Muslims were either dead or enslaved. Number 7, Catherine de' Medici. I'm chuckling, but I'm glad my obsession with rain in high school is about to come in handy. So serving as the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, Catherine had enormous political sway over her sons, the French kings Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. They reigned through the French wars of religion and faced problems with a group of Calvinist Protestants called the Huguenots. It is widely believed by historians that Catherine attempted to have their leader, Gaspard II de Calais, assassinated. The attempt failed, and fearing retaliation from the most powerful folks in power, Catherine planned to kill them all before they could take action. The result was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which resulted in the deaths of between, oh, 5,000 to 30,000 Huguenots. Number 6, Lady Elizabeth Bathory. Born in 1560 on a family estate in royal Hungary, Elizabeth was of noble lineage and privileged with education, wealth, and a lofty social rank. Her first taste of the morbidly bizarre was introduced to her during the early years of her life when she suffered seizures which might have been epilepsy. Treatment at the time for such bouts included feeding the patient human redness and bits of skull from a non-sufferer. She bore witness to brutal punishments and executions carried out by her father's officers and was influenced by family members involved with Satanism and witchcraft. When she was barely in the double digits of age, Elizabeth was engaged to Count Ferenc Nadasi, who she later married. Her husband spent much of his time away from home fighting the Ottomans, leaving Elizabeth to run the estate. Her Satanism became more pronounced as time wore on, and upon the death of her husband in 1601, her vicious crimes escalated. Most of her victims were girls around the age of the time she got married, and were usually the daughters of lesser gentry who had been sent to court to learn etiquette. Her favorite punishment methods including using pins to stick under her victims' fingernails and covering her victims in honey and leaving them out to be eaten by ants and other insects. Other methods included whipping her victims with nettles and frequently burning body parts, especially genitalia. After burning her victims, she would dump them in icy water. Many of them uh, were punished to the point of death, some of whom were buried in unmarked locations, and some sources even claim she engaged in people munching, making that her darkest secret. Elizabeth and a few of her servants were eventually arrested in 1610, and her accomplices were put on trial in 1611. With over 300 witness accounts and numerous testimonials, a guilty verdict was assured. A servant girl who claims to have seen evidence in Elizabeth's private books stated that her victims were around 650 folks. The accomplices were sentenced to death, and Elizabeth was confined to a bricked up room with slits for air and delivery of food. She was found dead a couple years later. Number 5, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was Envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and what I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? 
Uh, blood is not as thick as water. Ah, I don't really know. It's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so. That's rough. However, that being said, sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's weekend at Bernie's except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Ugh. Number three, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy. It wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks. Spoiled princess calling. Hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and, uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer that lurk in the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water, that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh-huh, one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no-cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So do you think his children grew up humble and wise? Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary. Number 10, Queen of Hating Her Daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number 9. Don't mess with the Empress. The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well, 
And I don't mean like slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number eight, mommy issues. Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime, but how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number seven, Rana Valona. I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian, you know, like the lemur. King Julian! Like that, that King Julian. Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Renavalona I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay, and would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number six, pretty firmly against cheating. Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from, at first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on, just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm -mm. I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn, that ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number five, Tamiris. Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization VI, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities, and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ Six player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about the Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which given how the way women were treated back then probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. 
but what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there, and Vietnam was a much smaller country or kingdom I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That That is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured, because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Have I see land lovers? Ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you, thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm gonna ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. And maybe you can cast me in there. And I can put on some long red hair and some boots and I could I could swim and just put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage, per se, than her, but it's her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap. Just don't. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat, and worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back in the tube when I was done with it. Ugh, I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally, and now I gotta make my bed? Oh, this is the worst day ever! I'm sure no other cute boy with blue eyes like me ever had this problem. Ugh! Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of Royal Prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy am asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for Old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was gonna have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. 
Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts to end her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five. The Bedchamber Crisis. May 1839, the Bedchamber Crisis happened when Whig politician Lord Melbourne resigned as Prime Minister. This was a big deal because it was only a couple years right after Victoria became Queen. So again, timing here was just not ideal. The first Prime Minister, Whig politician, Lord Melbourne, was close with Victoria originally. He actually convinced Victoria to appoint a good amount of her ladies in waiting. So he had power over her, but it was a mutual agreement. It wasn't like, you know, the other power that she had her whole life. This is they were homies. They were homies, I said, in a video about Victoria. So in 1839, when Melbourne resigned, Tory Robert Peel came in to be Prime Minister, and he requested that Victoria dismiss these ladies in waiting and then replace them with Tory ladies. Well, since Victoria was an OG and these were her only real friends if there was such a thing growing up, she said no. So of course she was criticized for such a choice. Prince Albert luckily was able to have some of her ladies resign voluntarily so things smoothed over eventually, but the queen honestly never got a break. Even on the happiest days, like number four, her engagement. The life of Queen Victoria wasn't anything like a fairy tale, obviously, as I've said anything so far. So when you think about the royal family, at least when I was younger, I thought being a queen or king was just eating chocolate all day and then you attend galas. Yeah, you just eat yummy foods, wear a crown, look cute, and then go to the ball. No, not quite. I, that's not really how it's like at all. Victoria had to do everything herself. She even had to propose to Prince Albert. It's royal tradition that nobody shall propose to a reigning monarch, so in October 1839, Victoria had to ask Albert for his hand in marriage. It all started when the pair were 17 years old. Victoria met the young prince, of course, at Kensington Palace. They were put together because Victoria's uncle felt like this could be beneficial down the road. They were first cousins, now they're getting married, which sounds bizarre, but as you've seen on this channel before, with royalty and stuff, it's quite common. Number three, first marriage. The wedding of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert happened in St. James Palace Chapel on February 10th, 1840. This was a big deal because it was the first time a ruling queen was getting married. This hadn't happened in 286 years. The last marriage of a reigning queen was in 1554, and that was Queen Mary I. Queen Victoria had 12 bridesmaids, wore white, had a lovely dress, thing was like 18 feet long, it was gorgeous. But it must have been so overwhelming for the young queen because she was isolated for her entire life, and then all of a sudden, what? You're getting married outside at 20 in front of all these crowds? After the wedding, Queen Victoria's head was hurting. It was probably so stressful, but she still had the time of her life. She wrote this in her diary after her wedding. She wrote, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert. His excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness, and gentleness, really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? To be called by names of tenderness I've never yet heard used to me before was bliss beyond belief. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. Yeah, when you're locked up and you have a horrible duchess watching your every move, this day probably sounds like a nice break. A well-deserved break, I'd say. Eat all the cake you can have. Number two, attacks. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. 
The first attack was back in 1840. An 18 year old man named Edward Oxford fired towards the Queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. And then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt after attempt. But at one point, things were creepy and almost worse. Number one, Boy Jones. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here at all, I saved it for last because it's very creepy. It's mind blowing in a horrible way. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. His name was Edward Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. Just some Assassin's Creed going on here. Guy just knows our route, I guess. That's so scary. He would break in and he would hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers figuratively and literally. Like he would go and he would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully the guy got caught. Number one is context on the missing queens. Lexi de los Santos, a Nat Geographic promoter, perfectly describes the treatment of Egyptian queens. Out of all the ancient civilizations, Egypt was the only one that really valued women. But after their rule, male leaders just erased all memory of these women because they didn't want them to have all that success. But why would ancient men in a culture that respected and revered women still strike them off the record in a fit of primal jealousy when they've been regal. It was best explained in the recent Bumblebee video, Top 10 Messed Up Things That Happened to Women in Ancient Egypt. It's the blame game. In ancient Egypt, pharaohs were supposed to be the human incarnate of the gods, but one thing that the male gods, female gods, and human females all had in common was the truest power, the womb. The ability to create and birth life, Ra's greatest creation. All of mankind came from Ra, the king god, yet any man who sat on the throne as pharaoh, meant to be the incarnate of Ra, was missing that one true power. So what that meant is any time a female pharaoh took the throne, she was more akin to the king god by the Egyptians' own definition than the male pharaoh ever could be. Call that a mic drop. Consequently, if the womb wielders had a built-in facet of power that you can't regulate, recreate, nor have for yourself, chances are you're gonna be pretty snubbed. So if she's all also a better ruler than her male counterparts, you're going to be resentful. Unfortunately, this means the documentation of many queens is lost to time. Their stories coming to us in broken pieces of pottery and papyrus, on ancient word of mouth from Greek and Rome, or from unidentified mummies that come and go as the sands blow thanks to the jealousy of mankind. Leader number nine will be Kenti Hase the first. So who was the first woman to rule Egypt? This will be the biggest debate of the video as there are technically three qualities. Qualifiers. First candidate is Kenti Kase the first. She was born circa 2550-2520 BC and died sometime between 2510 and 2490 BC. The remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within her necropolis until its excavation in the 1930s. And since its discovery at Giza, her tomb has intrigued historians and archaeologists alike. The mausoleum is as grand as other pyramids of her predecessors and includes a solar boat, a chapel, granary and a water tank. A small structure known as the washing tent of the female king had been built in front of her temple and here the body was washed and ritually purified prior to being embalmed. Her mastaba is believed to have been the final royal tomb that was constructed at that necropolis and many scholars believe that it was strongly connected to the pharaohs of the fourth and fifth dynasties. On its granite doorway her formal title is construed to be the mother of the king of upper and lower Egypt holding office as king of Upper and Lower Egypt. In support of the latter title is her image, which is altered to show her in a kingly pose, including the false beard, the royal Uraeus cobra crown, and holding a scepter, one of the many adjustments and additions made up until the 6th century, implying that this pharaoh possibly had continued a role in religion and worship after her death. Kenti may have ruled as a regent for her presumed son, Sahur, possibly in conjunction with Yusarkaf, the founder of the 5th dynasty. However, despite the fact that she was apparently considered an ancestress of the 5th dynasty, 
was commemorated in the mortuary chapel of Apsar at Kenikartes II, her name has never been found in a royal cartouche. Leader number eight is Mernith. Among ancient Egypt's greatest female leaders was Queen Mernith, who had the overwhelming ambition to rule a country and stopped whoever shared that sentiment. Her name means the beloved niece, the daughter of King Dier, and beloved she seemed to be, until after she died and then the men didn't have to respect her anymore, that is. Even if she wasn't the first woman to rule Egypt, she definitely seemed to be, but if historians want to debate endlessly, who am I to stop their fun? She definitely was the first woman to rule anything in known human history, because she was born about 3,000 years ago. Mernith stepped in as regent after her husband's death as their son Den was too young to rule at the time. Karakuni, an Egyptologist, said that these women were often used as protectors. Men would put women in high positions to keep young male leaders safe and give them time to mature. When a man was ready to take over as pharaoh, the woman in charge would step down. But Bernice was Old Kingdom Egypt, and when she assumed this tutelage, it was in despite of what religious traditions of the first dynasty decreed that only men were to rule. Despite that, Mernith stood rigidly by her son for a full decade, from 2939 to 2929 BC, until he became one of the most prominent kings of Old Kingdom Egypt. Despite the fact that there are few records of her name in any tombs, her accomplishments in life, she's still believed to have been a figure of great power and simultaneously respected and despised. Either way, she's one of those pharaohs that was buried alongside 50 live servants. Leader number seven is Nikokris. The third and most mysterious candidate for the first female king of Egypt is recorded many centuries later in the work of the Egyptian historian Manitho. Her name is Nikokris, and she was believed to have lived around the 22nd century BC, which was towards the end of the sixth dynasty. Some have suggested that Nikokris was the last pharaoh of this dynasty. As Manitho tells us, she built the third pyramid and reigned for 12 years, but the whole third pyramid thing is an absolute disaster if you know anything about ancient Egypt. There's just so much BS around the king's list and the dynasties. We don't know who made it, and every time we think we do, someone else shows up in history and has it attributed to them. So, it's up in the air. Herodotus also mentions Nikokris, but in the colorful context that she had killed hundreds to avenge the Egyptian king who had been slain by the people in a coup, and who happened to be her brother. The people had given the kingdom to Nikokris to rule after doing so. The story is, is that she had constructed an elaborate underground dining chamber under the guise of it being for her coronation, inviting all those she knew to be responsible for her brother's death as well as anyone who knew of the coup plan but did nothing of it. This includes servants, concubines, officials, priests, the whole shebang. As the banquet progressed, Nikokris, surveying safely from a platform, had her servants open the floodgates and let the flow of the Nile River into the chamber through a concealed pipe, drowning all in attendance. To quote Herodotus, that is all the information I was given about Nikokris, except that afterwards she threw herself in a chamber full of ashes to avoid retribution. Leader number six is Sobenekfru. It's not until the end of the Middle Kingdom that we find for the first time 100% pure clear evidence of a female king. So her name was Sobenekfru and there are about five variations of her name, all harder to say than the last. However, the name Sobenekfru means the beauties of Sobek in reference to the crocodile god. One, that the rulers of the 12th dynasty established a religious and economic center in Fayum 4, where crocodiles were nurtured and worshipped. Queen Sobenekfru rose to power after the death of her brother slash husband Amenhotep the fourth which made her the eighth ruler of Egypt's 12th dynasty and she went on to rule for nearly four years that was a lot of numbers in one sentence so I hope you're keeping up though missing her head in many the queen statues found in Fayum show that she appeared to combine masculine and feminine aspects of regal dress similar to many other female rulers of Egypt she is the last ruler prior to the new kingdom to appear in the offering list found at Abidos and Sekera which does suggest just some kind of posthumous verdict that separates her from the kings who follow her with equally short reigns. How Sobenekfru died or where she was buried remains a mystery. Some have suggested that her burial might be in one of the pyramids at Mazgana, but this is very unlikely, as is Amenhat's labyrinth or Herkiopolis, both of which she contributed to. Thus, one of the most powerful women of the early world history remains a mystery. Queen number five is the maniacal mind. Fredegon of Nestria began her life as a forced laborer in the early 500s, but all that labor made her strong because she sure as hell knew how to climb a social ladder. By her early 20s, she'd become a lover 
and then wife to Chilperic, the King of Francia. As queen, she regularly smoked court members who got in her way or interest in keeping Chilperic installed on the throne, and then paving the way for her son to assume the job when her husband died. To clear his path, Fredegon had to be vicious. At one point in the late 500s, Chilperic was at war with his brother Sigibert, at which point Fredegon simply said, baby, let me handle it. And so she effing did with some poisoned axes and a well-planned hit job. The brutal slaying kept Chilperic in power and kept Fredegon in her esteemed role as the king's right-hand woman. Later down the line, dysentery killed two of Chilperic's sons from his first marriage, and Fredegon's cogs started turning again. This in her mind was the opportunity to wipe out that entire lineage and ensure any offspring she produced with the king would be the heir. So she sent another one of those sons to literally live in the disease outbreak area. Then she put together a plot to kill another one of his sons who'd already been happened to be plotting against Chilperic, so it worked out. In the end, Chilperic himself was killed, and it's not entirely clear if Fredegon was the one who set that in motion. Chilperic's other brother assumed the throne and had Fredegon sent off to the countryside to live out her life in anonymity. She didn't make it out there very long, though. Soon she overthrew him and set up a new government ruled, aka she was co-regent and essentially ruler herself, by her infant son, Clothar II. While he grew up, Fredegon reigned as regent and continued to prove her cunning. Queen number four is the Pirate Queen. It took Rome 23 years to defeat the Carthage in the First Punic War, but once they did, they gained full control of Sicily and established themselves without question as the world's most impressive power. So they were undoubtedly rulers of the entire Mediterranean then, right? Wrong. So there was this badass pirate chick named Tueta, the queen of a breakaway land called Ilia, who hadn't surrendered to the Romans. Her people were still fighting viciously over in the Balkans. They hadn't given up to the world's largest military yet. Tueta had been the queen regent of the clan alongside her husband, King Agron, but Agron had been in the Adriatic Sea, winning battles and conquering other smaller kingdoms for some time. So when he did finally return home, he partied so hard in celebration, he literally dropped dead. It is a whole story, I don't have time for it, so we're gonna move past it, I'll tell it in another video. So Tueta took over Elria. Without the power to fight Romans head on, she resorted to vicious piracy in both the Adriatic and the Mediterranean. No merchant ship was safe while passing through those waters, and soon, word made it up to the Roman Senate about how the waters around Elria were essentially like sailing directly into death. Finally, after near constant ship losses, deaths, and stolen goods, Rome took action. At first, they sent envoys to Tueta to ask her nicely to stop, but she imprisoned and killed every single one of them. So the Romans declared outright war on her, and Homegirl was meeting this insanely large army shot for shot, which is crazy, but unfortunately ruined for her when her own allies betrayed her. Still, Tueta had one more trick up her sleeve. During the surrender, she met the Romans at the city of Rizan. Legends has it, even though Tueta relinquished her rule in that city, she refused to give up her life. She threw herself off a cliff. And ever since, locals claim that Rizan, which is now modern day Montenegro, has been the only city on the Bay of Kotor to never have any success in ocean commerce or naval might. Queen number three is the Lady Emperor. She left an undeniable mark in history, seeing as Wu Zetian, also known as Wu Zhao, is the only female emperor in Chinese history. History. From 665 to 705, she started as an empress consort and upgraded over time to the Empress Dowager, establishing the Wuzhou dynasty. Wu's rise to power is thanks to her strategic maneuvers and political alliances. She initially gained Emperor Gao Zong's favor in lieu of her romantic rival and his literal wife, Empress Wang. In 652, she gave birth to her first son and her second in 653, but the emperor had already designated his eldest son from another consort as his heir. However, <gasps> Tragedy struck when Wu had a daughter, but she made it work, weirdly. Disturbingly, accounts suggest that Wu orchestrated her daughter's death and falsely blamed the emperor's wife for the demise so as to finally be rid of her. Wu even orchestrated the brutal death sentence of the empress as her legs and feet are severed before she was drowned in wine. While historical portrayals have often depicted Wu Zetian as ruthless and morally questionable, historians urge us nowadays in modern times to be critical in considering the potential biases and political motivations of those who documented her in ancient times when women usually never ruled. Scholars have recently reevaluated her reign, examining her accomplishments and contributions to the empire. Queen number two is the Celt Pirate Queen. That's right, a second pirate queen. And if you thought Tueta of Elria was a badass pirate queen, wait until you learn about Grace O'Malley. This sixth century Irish clan leader was a red-headed warlord who spit in the face of challenge, and for literal decades, she and her armed forces fought to keep the English from invading Ireland. Grace came of age just after Henry VIII declared himself King of Ireland very suddenly. The English were moving on to the island, and the Irish didn't care for that shit at all. So Grace 
Grace's father was the lord of the O'Malley dynasty, who were West Coast seafarers, and Grace had grown up on the water. One story says on her first expedition with him, he joked that her long hair would catch and tangle in the ship rigging, and so to stay away. So our girl Grace simply hacked off her hair. Forever after, she was known as Grace the Bald in their language. As she grew older, Grace married, but she didn't settle down. Her first husband died, so she takes to the high seas with the band of Irish pirates who were, as forementioned, dead set on maintaining Ireland's independence from England. Grace was so passionate that between her charismatic drive and her ability to lead, she amassed a pirate hall of nearly two dozen ships. Then she started raiding coastal Tudor villages on the other side of Ireland and England like a true pirate scoundrel. She did this for decades, quite literally until Queen Elizabeth I got sick of it and appealed to Grace for a meeting, which she agreed to on the condition that some of her captured Irish family members are freed. What happened next remains stuff of legend amongst Irish people today. Grace met with the Queen Elizabeth and infamously refused to bow before Her Majesty. That was unheard of at the time, but O'Malley didn't see herself as one of the Queen's subjects and she cared very little for formalities. Symbolically, that bow ended up being significant because it marked the practical end of Grace's vicious reign and her family members were released from captivity, but in exchange, her days of piracy on the high seas were over for good. Queen number one is the world's most foul, but to be totally realistic, also the most misunderstood and badass queen. You know where you love her, it's Rana Vanalona, who reigned Madagascar alongside her husband until his abrupt death in 1828, at which point Rana looked over her country and the people and decided, it's time for a remodel. Knowing it was unheard of in her time for a female to lead, Rana started off strong by annihilating any potential enemies for the next three or four weeks after announcing her sole rule. She killed hundreds, and it seems like it was a pretty efficient use of time, seeing as she went on to reign 33 years undisturbed. At that time, the isolated islands stopped trading with African people in the West and ruled back its agreements with European nations and other world powers. By isolating Madagascar nearly completely, she was also able to have her way with its poorest citizens, exploiting the island's long-standing practice called Phanom Poyana, in which poor Malagasy people or criminals perform manual labor to settle unpaid debts and taxes. The results were brutal for these people, with many dying from hunger and awful living conditions. Then in the 1850s, she specifically banned Christianity from being practiced in her homeland to preserve the cultural values and deter colonization on the island. Many protested, but she didn't care for their dissent, and those who didn't hold their tongue lost it, or even faced trial by ordeal, her preferred method of judge and jury. She would lace pieces of chicken skin with tangina tree poison. Then those critics had to eat the poison chicken raw and vomit it back up. If they survived the ingestion and regurgitation, it proved they were loyal to her. If they died, that proved they had been secretly disloyal and their deaths were warranted. Naturally, eating poison and yakking it up in the form of raw chicken is gonna kill you nine times out of ten. In the worst cases, she sought out these activists and just had them kill in really brutal ways. During Rana's reign, the population of Madagascar was cut in half. When she died peacefully in 1861, her son Radama II took over and he was a little more chill. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal Curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? 
Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad. It's tragic. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbag. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial, so Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest. Horrible. That's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy. Listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. So Mary was close, but now what? Well, Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? 
No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having de legitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you 
have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it, you're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you have a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's... Horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like 
bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Randall Bologna ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic, keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chilonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chilonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one, 
Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chimay. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10, Marie Antoinette, Madame Deficit. The last queen of France and maybe the last time royals got away with well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound, when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation, will be worth $12 million US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving, and honestly, if people don't have anything, including food, ooh, it's not gonna be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing, and in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number nine, Queen Victoria. Oh, blighty. Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time, I don't know. She's, I don't know, big ched, we'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's five minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number eight, Cleopatra. Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. She's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power and to not have one, but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt, but maybe had the most drama. Sure, Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood, and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too, but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot, of, a lot of affairs happening. Number seven, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else, something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say, it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. I was this big stupid kid, can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash most likely within the next 12 hours. I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. 
God bless the queen and God save the queen. Shout out to the UK. Chetty loves you. How you doing? Come, come and see me sometime. I love you guys. Now, sure, she's not the most awful spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like, for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. Pfft. No, what are, you, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. Number five, Marie Antoinette. So France's queen between 1774 and 1792 was Marie Antoinette, who was, you know, the last queen before the French Revolution. She had quite the reputation for splurging on expensive things and found herself in quite a few scandals. One in particular was the affair of the diamond necklace. So Countess de Lamotte, a young lady, pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a high society member into believing that Antoinette loved him. She even hired a buy selling worker and disguised her as the queen and convinced the man that uh, Marie wanted to purchase a diamond necklace. The jewelry cost around 1,600,000 livres then, which is almost $12 million today. The money was never paid, and the queen had no clue about what had taken place, but even though she was innocent, the public still despised her. Granted, she's mostly known for her infamous dialogue. When French subjects could not afford bread, she said, let them eat cake, which fueled the French Revolution and ultimately led to her um, execution. Number four, Queen of Castile. So Juana La Loca was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband passed in 1506, her father buried his body. However, Juana used to open the tomb and caress her husband's dead body. And ultimately, she ordered the body dug out and kissed her husband's feet. Additionally, she would carry his coffin everywhere with her and actually kept it under her bed. Years later though, she eventually allowed his burial outside her window. Look, I just keep weird dolls under my bed. Number three, Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg. Maria Eleonora, born on November 11th of 1599, passing eventually on March 28th of 1655, held the title of Queen of Sweden from 1620 to 1632 as the wife of King Gustav II Adolf. Coming from a noble German family, she belonged to the prestigious house of I'm not even gonna try and say that. However, when Maria and Gustav gave birth to a girl with a genetic condition causing excessive hair growth, Maria was deeply shocked. The unexpected appearance of her daughter, combined with uh, societal beauty expectations, pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous creature. When Gustav died when Christina was only um, this many years old, Maria blamed her for his death. For over a year, Maria subjected Christina to very harsh punishment, confining her to blacked out, darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for very extended periods, even placing her father's open casket in Christina's room and demanding she sleep next to it, which that's way too morbid, even by my standards. Maria's mental state deteriorated, eventually leading to Christina's removal from her custody. So thank goodness for Christina. Number two is Sixty the Dragon Lady. So the story of her rise to power is a remarkable one. Born at a time when Chinese women were politically invisible, this lady managed to acquire enormous political influence by exploiting her position as a royal concubine, engaging in court intrigues and manipulating those around her. By the end of the 1860s, she had become the most powerful individual in China. Her will and her reach even exceeded two male emperors, who she frequently bypassed or overruled. Now, she was originally born Lan Kuo in 1835, the daughter of a minor Manchu official, and at age 15, she was selected as a potential concubine for the emperor and relocated to the Forbidden City. She was elevated to the status of concubine of officially by age 18, eventually giving birth to the emperor's only son, Zhechun, a feat that earned her another promotion in the palace hierarchy. The emperor died in 1861, and shortly after the disastrous Second Opium War, left the throne to his only son. So as the mother of the reigning emperor, Sixi was given the courtesy title Dowager Empress. So by this point, the empress had become quite adept at manipulation, palace intrigues, and power games. Through forged evidence and false testimony, she engineered the arrest of the eight ministers, three of whom were later executed. With the Regency Council gone, the empress became the de facto regent for the duration of her son's reign, until his early death from smallpox in 1875. The empress was instrumental in the succession, choosing her young nephew Zetian, who was crowned as emperor. 
so once again, this dowager empress acted as regent to the infant emperor, this time in a more formal capacity. Twelve years into the young emperor's reign, our empress moved to the summer palace in Beijing and surrounded by a network of informants and advisors doted on by loyalists and conservatives in the bureaucracy and military, she continued to exert enormous influence on appointments, policies, and matters of state. Stories of the empress's extravagance are prevalent, since it has been claimed that she regularly increased her personal and food allowances, uh, that she withdrew gold and silver from dwindling national reserves, and spirited millions of pounds offshore into bank accounts in London. Other tales of her exorbitant spending include her decision to spend 10 million silver teals, uh, some set aside to rebuild the Chinese navy, on the renovation of one of her palaces. Another rumor claims that 3,000 ebony boxes were needed to restore her jewelry collection. Number 1. Agrippina the Younger So Julia Agrippina, also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was a Roman empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances to the future emperor, Galba, who showed no interest in her and was devoted to his wife. On one occasion, Galba's mother-in-law gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. She was one of the most prominent women in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, functioning as a behind-the-scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via, you know, the powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession, and Claudius became aware of her plotting, but died in 54, and it was rumored that Agrippina uh, poisoned him. She exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was killed. Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Number 10. Marie Antoinette I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France. To sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, lay Miz reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Number 9. Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Sometimes it's just in the name, isn't it? Like Mario, you know that he's an Italian plumber. Or Luigi, you can tell that that's an Italian plumber's brother. And uh, King DDD, King of the. DDDs or, or something, I, I don't know. Okay, maybe the names don't always give it away, but Bloody Mary does. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake were hotter. No cap. Number 8. Reina Valona of Madagascar This one is a new one for me. Didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Reina Lo Queen I'm, gonna say, I'm just going to call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, how can I make things better? Huh, I know. How about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes! Very uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately, she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and yeah, it's a bad thing. And it does bring some bad stuff with it. However, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe. And that's that's good. Money's good. You like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that. So she reformed. And by that, I mean she repressed and, and re-unalive people. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing. It me a familia. You know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taken over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging, oh wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's alright, bad segue. Well, the the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear sweet mother. 
Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys. No words. Number six, Fu Hao. Another woman in history married to a man in the stinky patriarchy. Worst, except Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. Number five, Bloody Mary. Duh. Mary the First, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better Queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary I ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number four, taking over. Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused a whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. 
She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost $12 million by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number 1. Countess Not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560 Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam! Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord was she a bad dudette. Not good. Kicking off the list at number 10, 18 years old. Queen Victoria's reign began back in 1837 and lasted until the Queen's death in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandria Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was the fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely she would ever get the crown to begin with. And then, one by one, all of her family members began passing away. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed, and then her father and her grandfather both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next in line for the throne. Number 9. The Kensington System So as if that wasn't already stressful enough being at that age and already seeing what's happened, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington System, which if you haven't heard of before is pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this Kensington system to control her daughter, ideally. She literally isolated the child from playmates or even family members. Her mother did this to keep her pure. Yeah, the system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every single action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up entirely. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lenigan, and the Duchess's attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I only had three friends growing up, but this, this is just cruel. This is a whole new level. She shared a room with her mother until she was the queen. She literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone without her mother being right there by her side. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and obviously she hates John. Conroy for manipulating her mother, she refers to him as demon incarnate. Number 8. Publicity The Duchess was pretty cruel to Victoria just because you're next in line doesn't mean it's going to be glamorous speed dating and no one's doing a musical number while you meet your handsome Prince Charming, it's nothing like that at all. Victoria was forced to go on these long, excruciating, boring tours around England in hopes for the Duchess to sell her daughter to the public, the public eye, so these crowds would start to gather at all these appearances. They loved the young Victoria. Thing is, during one of these tours, October 1835, Victoria got really sick, she had a bad fever, and the Duchess was using the weak Victoria, she was taking advantage of her. But luckily she got better, and obviously her mother couldn't do anything crazy, but she, was, she had her sights set on her while she was sick, that's pretty cruel, that's disgusting. Number 7. Name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks and we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best, right? It's called Victoria Day. It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? There's no question about that. Victoria Day, her day. Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, and Victoria's uncle, Prince Regent, only let a few people come. Her name, as I mentioned earlier, was originally Alexandrian Victoria, and at that time, the name Victoria wasn't regal. It was of French origin. Almost an odd name to have at the time, really. So when this throne snuck up to her, she was advised to change her name to something more mm, traditional, but as our calendars tell us, she said, nah, I'm good, I'll keep it. Number 6. Moving Out Queen Victoria had turned 18 right before she was handed the crown. The timing here was key, because now this meant Victoria could 
leave and just do things. Yeah, for once in her damn life, she could leave her mother and John. She moved from Kensington to Buckingham Palace, and after that point, Victoria, of course, didn't speak with John or her mother really ever again. It was just a couple years into Victoria's reign where John's influence started to get limited. He ended up resigning, and then he moved to Italy, and then when she was crowned a year later at Westminster Abbey, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary, I shall remember this day as the proudest of my life. Queen Victoria was the first royal family member to live at Buckingham Palace. She moved. She was like, I'm, no, I'm gonna go live over there. you be the first. I'm gonna start my new thing. I'm never gonna live in a palace. I'm like, that's a good castle. I like it. Driveway's a little long for me. Shoveling would hurt my Canadian back, but otherwise, I like the bricks. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening in what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria. Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number four, short kings unite. Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just wanna be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room where the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s, at least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time. It was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess 
a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the Queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number 8, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. Pirate Queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530 around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess and not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But I didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back. I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. 
She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day, and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rocked the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant. Only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. 
What do you guys think? At number 10, Blinded by Ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke off, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carried that pain with them as much as Catherine de Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26. So so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standards, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just you know marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. 
At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman, he is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. At number three, Evil Empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one-two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part-time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. 
If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did. You know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other. They were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold, they all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once, spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun.